I think we are now on live and I'm going to turn to Danny to see other questions coming in. He's done a thumbs up. We're on live, Michael. Yay! And I think we're broadcasting on your page and my page so your peeps and my peeps can all see us. Oh, very cool. So happy Sunday, Michael. Happy Sunday to anyone who's chosen to tune in today. And um, Michael and I did a workshop recently called Experiencing God, which was very well received. We had amazing feedback for it. So we wanted to continue the conversation some more here on this Facebook Live and bring it out to all of you. So Michael, <clears throat> anything you'd like to say at this point, even for your... Um... Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I think, I think in a way, the best starting point is, is to just kind of come clean. And we did this live and we do this in the online program, but to come clean about the fact that we both kind of backed our way into calling it experiencing God. I think if I saw the little blurb for the Facebook live, we even used quotes around the word God, just so you know, <laughs> you know, I think it was going to be experiencing the presence. Yes. Which is a lovely way of talking about it. And then at one point, Anita and I were talking and just went, I, I said, look, I'm just too chicken to say experiencing God. And she went, yeah, me too. So we, we said it like we meant it. Yes. In fact, I like that it's called experiencing God because, um, you know, I'm aware that God means different things to different people. I'm aware that some people are attracted to the word God, but at the same time, there are some people who run a mile if they think it's uh, because in their head, they kind of perceive it's the religious God. And so they run a mile from it because they've had bad experiences with religion or they don't believe in religions. So I was aware that there is a lot of baggage attached to the word. But I think that um, with the limit of language, there aren't a lot of words that actually describe that feeling. And let's in, you know, um, I refer to that feeling of oneness, that feeling I experienced on the other side. And to say that I experienced God when I was on the other side is probably closer to anything that I can think of. It's closer to any way that I can possibly describe that experience. Well, and I think for me, it's the same thing. I, I grew up with, with God as a little bit of a dirty word. And, and it's just a word. And like all words, it exists to try and describe something. Yes. And in this case, that something is so indescribable by its very nature that the more words we've got, the better. You know, so we can call it pure consciousness. We can call it the oneness. We can call it infinite love. We can call it infinite awareness. We can call it God. And we're just trying to find some way to put a, a few bits of clothing on the invisible man. <laughs> if you remember those movies where like they would put bandages and you could see him because of the bandages. Well, it's like putting words to this feeling, to this experience, are, are just a way to make it a little bit more tangible until you're actually experiencing it for yourself. And then it's the most tangible thing in the world. Yes. And I think that um, we you know, we needn't get hung up on the words that people use to describe it. Because I know for me, I'm certainly not describing um, a, a male being with human qualities. Uh, that's not what I mean when I say God at all. For me, experiencing God is experiencing that part of you that is infinite, that part of you that expresses itself through this physical body in this space and time this physical body in this space and time is very temporary and it is um it's basically there is something an observer behind your eyes and to me that observer is expressing god or it is your connection to god or is it it's your it's your facet of god that is expressing itself through your eyes using your hands and using your body. That's kind of the way I look at it. Well, I think that's, that's one of the big things for me is, ha, has been seeing the progression, experiencing the progression from 
little me trying to have a relationship with some big energy outside of me to pathetic, useless little me in the face of this great energy, even though maybe it's a part of it, but you know, to, to actually experiencing, no, this, this aliveness, this godness, this oneness animates us. Yeah. It, it uses us, it fills us up. And, and so far from being sort of a, you know, pathetic in the face of the, the greatness of look away from the light and all that. I think I was just dabbing actually, but, but, but suddenly we allow ourselves to be filled up with it. We allow ourselves to be an expression of it. And then everything in life starts to make sense in a completely different way. It does. It actually really does. Because um, I think a lot of people, uh, the reason why we lose our way is because we, we don't realize that we are an expression of it. And so we go seeking it and we seek out God outside of us and we seek God's approval. But actually, there is nobody's approval that you really need because it is about realizing that you are not this five sensory being in a three dimensional world um, that is purely limited to your physical body, that you already have this God energy coursing through you, expressing itself through you. And it's when you get in touch with that, when you realize it, whether it's through meditation or whatever practices you do, or being in nature or whatever works for you, um, it actually changes your life's experiences. And I think though that, um, you know, to me, that is what enlightenment is. And I often tread very carefully when I talk about the subject of enlightenment. And, uh, and the reason I tread very carefully is because we have a lot of people in the, in the world um, who are, who proclaim to be enlightened and um and i tend to steer clear from the word i'm trying to figure out how to articulate this because i always worry that um when somebody likes other people to know they are enlightened and they can help other people to become enlightened or lead other people to enlightenment it starts a cult this starts a cult following um whereas <clears throat> i actually believe that you don't need to follow someone in order to become enlightened. Enlightenment is available for every single person. It's not an exclusive club. And whereas a lot of uh, cult leaders, a lot of um, self-proclaimed gurus, false gurus, like you to believe that it is an exclusive club and that the only way to get there or to touch it or to have a glimpse of it is through them. And that's how they hold on to their followers. And so, that's why I'm very careful how I use the word enlightenment, because I honestly believe that it is available for everybody. If that is their intention, if that is what they want to do, if that is their dharma, then it is available for them. Attaining enlightenment is not the hard part, but holding on to it while living in this um, fear-based um, world, this paradigm we live in, that's the harder part. Well, do you, do you mind if I read a story from, from the new... Um, super coach book sure it, I don't mind at all oh congratulations on your new book by the way thank you comes out on Tuesday um, but this, this is a story called the Bodhisattva's vow um, one day a seeker who had devoted many lifetimes to attaining enlightenment broke through the habitual thinking of his everyday mind and saw the world around him as no more than samsara a projection of his own largely fearful thoughts his entire being was filled with joy and he felt as if every cell in his body was dissolving into the bliss of nirvana. It was as though the gates of heaven had opened up to him, and he glided effortlessly toward them. But no sooner had he set one foot in heaven than he heard a sound that filled his heart with compassion. He turned back to see a seemingly infinite number of perfect beings acting for all the world like trapped cattle, struggling to make their way in the world and suffering at the hands of phantoms created by their own thoughts. In that moment, he made this vow. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. 
To this day, it is said, the Bodhisattva works tirelessly for the liberation of all sentient beings, one foot planted firmly in heaven, the other planted firmly here on earth. To me, that's what becomes possible, is, is to live with one foot in heaven and one foot on earth, to live with one foot in this yes. other dimension beyond the five senses, this dimension of consciousness, and, and to live in the world of the senses, the world of form, and to let that life be enlivened by the other. Absolutely. That is exactly how I feel. Um, and that's a beautiful passage in your book. Wow, I'm going to get a copy myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know the author. I might be able to work something out for you. <laughs> yes. Um, I, um, I actually... Just a you know a quick thing for the for the people listening in. One of the reasons that um, I I love Michael's work is because he he is a wordsmith and he is able to provide me with words of things that I feel that I sense that I experienced on the other side. He gives me more words to d describe them, and I always feel um, and he gives me the language because I always feel our English language does a poor job of describing anything, of providing language to describe anything that is beyond our five senses. And so that is a, 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 that gives us a handicap. Those of us who are more sensory, those of us who are more uh, sensitive, and those of us who are empaths, we are short on language to describe what it really feels like to have sensory overload, to be an empath, to sense things. Um, so I often find myself short on words, and so I, I call on Michael sometimes to give me the language, and so he's he, he's he, he's my wordsmith. Um, somebody, Michael Fawcett, has written. What's the book called? It's called Super Coach. And let's just quickly flash up the uh, the the graphic for it. Super Coach: Ten Secrets to Transforming Anyone's Life. Michael Neal. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I, I love, love it. it. I love the graphic. Cool. Super coach. Uh, <laughs> That's great. So, um, and so this is one of the things I find about your work is that you're very good with words and, and, um, and I, I mean, I, I appreciate it. And I think part of that is because I'm very aware of their limitations, right? Yeah. Is, is that ultimately Silence is the only spiritual teaching. Yeah. And the problem is silence makes for terrible radio. <laughs> right? Like you, you can't, most people just won't sit there and allow themselves to drop into the silence. So sometimes the words can guide us towards the silence of our own hearts, of our own souls. It can guide us into the stillness where all spiritual knowledge is already waiting for us. And, and, and so I have a healthy respect for language and a healthy disrespect of it. Because it can also make it seem like we know what we're talking about when we have no idea. Yes. <laughs> right? There's a lot of very pretty words that have been said about God over the last few, oh, I don't know, millennium. Yeah. Right? And some of them have been connected up to the experience. And a lot of them haven't. A lot of them have led to destruction and killing and things that are actually the, I guess, the, that run complete counter to what anyone who truly experiences God would even do. And, oh, I just wanted to read out a comment. Eleanor Mann, thank you for your comment. This is exactly what Wayne always spoke about. When we get in touch with our higher self, we realize the God in us. Yep. That's exactly it. And when you realize that within you, there are no words. You, you run out of words because you know, you know, um, and you, you feel this connection to everything and everybody looks beautiful. And Michelle Dillon and Shiflet, thank you. Lots of love to both of you. Thank you for that. And um, Michelle is lovely. She's an administra administrator on one of my groups. So thank you. Hello. That's very cool. I've never seen the little Facebook Live thing like that. That's really nice. I know that's Danny's handiwork. He's, uh, he's wow. behind the scenes. Um, 
Oh. Anything to stay off camera, Danny. I, <laughs> I know. Next week, I'm bringing Danny on camera. I don't care what he says. So many people have written to me and said they want to see him. They want to hear his side of the story. So yeah, as... You said that the camera started to wobble and then fall over. So that you know... <laughs> I know. I know. Suddenly, imagine if my sound went off as I was saying this. And so people will be welcome to ask him absolutely anything. And as long as he doesn't um, talk about what it's like to live with me, He'll be safe. <laughs> Ask him absolutely anything except what everybody wants to know. I know, exactly. No, and I'm kidding. Actually, you can ask him absolutely anything, even what it's like to live with me. Oh, my God. What am I setting myself up for? <laughs> oh, and Wendy Lynn is just sending hugs to Danny. Danny. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Yes, yeah, so you, they all get a conversation with him. Um, so I was thinking... Um, if you had to put words to enlightenment, the, what would it mean for you, Michael? Well, there, there's two different things that I hear being pointed to when people use the word enlightenment. And, and one is the cessation of the personal. It, it's the death of the ego. It's the disappearance of the little me. Yep. And the little me can disappear because it doesn't actually exist. In other words, it only exists in thought and thought comes and goes. So when the thought of me is not there, what's left is the light. Hence enlightenment. It's the light of consciousness. It's the light of God. It's the light of pure awareness. And so that's, you know, the irony being that anybody who devotes themselves to becoming enlightened the one person who won't be there when you become enlightened is you, <laughs> right? So it's kind of an odd goal, you know, for, for an ego to have. But I think the other thing that we, we talk about sometimes, and I think meaningfully when we talk about enlightenment, are those moments where we touch that space, wake up to that space. The, you, you know, they're, they're like, um, in Zen they would talk about them as, as mini satoris. Yeah. Just moments of clear seeing, moments where we drop out of the concept of us, the conceptual mind, and drop into this deeper place, this God place, this pure consciousness place, this place that, you know, you talk about as heaven. You know, what if this is heaven? Yeah. I love I, that. I love the words that you've given it. And a few people have also offered their own words for enlightenment or nirvana. Uh, we have a comment from David O'Connor who says, nirvana is achieved when you lose yourself, leaving only your connection with God. That's very true. That's very, very beautiful. And um, I, I mm -hmm. even take it a step further, David, and say, leaving only God. Because at that point, there's no you to have a connection with God. It's just yes. not godding, right? It's, it's God talking it's to God, God to God. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's all there is. That's exactly right. That's all there is. And you just are godding. And we have a comment from Susan Richards. Love and hugs to both of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Susan. Um, in fact... I want to actually speak about ego for a few minutes because what's really interesting is I feel the ego has to go full circle for no, this may not apply to everyone. I'm kind of forming my words as I'm forming my thoughts. So it's kind of like thinking out loud. But when we realize that we are God, when we are living from that space, um, the ego becomes insignificant, irrelevant. It becomes, um, it's like we realize we are one and there's no ego involved in that. But when we are, um, when we are living in this world, when we are living in and integrating in this physical world and dealing with other people, when you are someone who is, for example, a, a super sensitive, empathic person where you feel the emotions of other people and you need other people to feel good so that uh, you can feel good, 
because you know when you feel everybody's emotions you need them to feel good so that you can feel good this is a common theme with empaths and so they're constantly running around trying to make other people feel good and as we run around try to make other people feel good we attract more and more people who are needy who who are attracted to people who go around doing things for other people you you know what i'm trying to say here now if we don't have an ego at that point when we are um when we are interacting in this world as an empath trying to please everyone and if we don't have an ego we lose our individuality we lose ourselves to the needs of everyone else and we become susceptible to becoming people pleasers and doormats and so very often i tell empaths for this journey for this part of the journey you do need to hold on to your ego it's not about being egotistical but it is about knowing who you are as an individual and knowing that their emotions are not your emotions and you don't have to make yourself a doormat and it's not egotistical to love yourself that's that's what i wanted to really say about the ego because i used to really be um before i even had the near death experience um i was immersed in spiritual teachings which were taught to me by other gurus and these gurus and i'm and again this is not a blanket statement for all spiritual teachers absolutely not but i've had some bad experiences where i was told that i had to overcome my ego what ended up happening was i ended up giving all my power away to those gurus and probably at those spiritual teachings the person with the biggest ego in the room was the spiritual guru um so you end up giving your power away if you suppress your ego while you are interacting within this paradigm that's We talk about this a, a lot you and I in the self study program and 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 sort of I was sharing my 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 kind of loathing of being told to be humble yes because I was always to my mind being told make more room for my ego please but but actually the thing that changed it for me was the the quote that I I I share in the program from Sid Banks that humility isn't thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less right when we are not so much on our mind we just naturally write things out and kind of it go with us we we don't get into this whole debate in our heads about well is this too selfish should i be like this should i be like that all of that is selfing versus godding and i liked what you just said it isn't about thinking less of ourselves it is about thinking of ourselves less yeah. and so stop and, being the most interesting person in the room yes but it doesn't mean you think less of yourself you can absolutely love yourself know that you are god but you don't need to think of yourself all the time look i'm i'm god but i'm a really average tennis player yeah right? that's it those two things are not incompatible yeah <laughs> exactly right exactly right um yeah i i'm god and i'm pretty average at a lot of things <laughs> yeah. yeah and i think i think it's helpful to see that that even being god is impersonal. <laughs> yeah. It's not like you're more god than somebody else. I know exactly. We all we Well, you we, were you were doing pretty good at 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 godding, but then, you know, you you ate that ice cream and you're supposed to be on a low carb diet. So, not so god now, are you? No. Right? Oh my god. And if only you saw how, uh, you know, I gave in and bought another pair of sneakers. That was even less godding. <laughs> You know, yet another pair of sneakers so it's quite funny that on the one hand we talk about the oneness and on the other hand we take a bunch of things about ourselves we don't like and go well that's not the oneness <laughs> well how, how can anything not be part of everything see that's the thing it's all part of everything and um which brings me to the fact that even our bad experiences our being hurt it's all part of godding it's all part of the oneness it's all part of the experience and we have this tendency to think that um oh yeah and 
Eleanor Mann has just said, when you help others, you forget about yourself, which is so true. And that's when you're, when you are guarding, you actually forget about yourself. You're allowing. It's the other way too, Eleanor. When you forget about yourself, you help others. Yes. That's, that's right. Like they're both true. Mm -hmm. And do you know, when I didn't love myself, which was before, um, yeah, before I had the NDE, before I had, when I had the cancer, when I didn't love myself, I used to be thinking about myself all the time. While I was being a doormat, while I was being a ple people pleaser, I was constantly thinking about myself. I was constantly fearful. I was constantly coming from a place of fear. So uh, am I doing this right? Um, have I got their approval? And what happens is when you actually do realize that you are an expression of God, you do forget about yourself because you kind of think, okay, I've, I've got this. So what can I go out and do now? What, how can I help people? Well, if you, check, you can check this for yourself, everyone, everyone who's listening, right? You can check for yourself. Whatever it is that you really love doing in your life, I can pretty much promise you, you don't think of yourself while you're doing it. That right? is so That's true. That's why you love it because you're not there. Yeah. That little while you have permission for it not to be all about you. I used to, I used to think that I needed to teach 24 seven because the one place where I, it wasn't about me was when I was teaching. And eventually I realized, oh, it doesn't have to be about me when I'm not teaching. I just think it does. It's interesting because, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be about us anytime. And one of the things that we make a mistake in feeling is that when we're having a positive experience, then we feel like we are in alignment. We're in alignment with God or we are expressing God. But when we're having a negative experience, we kind of beat ourselves up and say, what am I not getting? And why am I not in alignment? Or what have I missed here? And how can I get back in alignment? Um, and so if that's what you tend to feel and if you tend to beat yourself up, I would actually suggest just relaxing and knowing that even that experience that you've judged as negative is part of the bigger picture. It's part of experiencing God. It's part of the oneness. Because one of the things that shifted for me actually is that prior to the NDE, um, I actually used to um, be really, really into the law of attraction because people told me that I attracted the cancer to me with my thoughts. And so I had to now try and figure out how to attract a different reality and how to get rid of the cancer. And so I would start fearing my thoughts. But what's happened as a result of the near-death experience is nowadays when I'm going through something that doesn't feel great, and if I'm going through a bad experience, I no longer think that, oh, I must have attracted it with my thoughts. I no longer feel that way. What happens is I found this just happens. I suddenly become the observer of what's happening. It's like I almost step out of myself and I think, huh, okay, this is taking place. I wonder where this is going to go. And I become a passenger of my life while this phase is going through. And at the end of it, I realize that, oh, that was a really good experience. I got a lot out of that because even our negative experiences, they do pass. They always pass. But when we are immersed in it, beating ourselves up, judging ourselves, telling ourselves we shouldn't be going through this, I should know better, I've done all the work, that actually compounds it and makes it even worse. Well, it's the idea, I, to, to my mind, that gets us all into trouble, is that we control the universe at some level. Yes. We think we control it through action, or we think we control it through thought, or we think we control it with our mind. To me, a much more apt analogy, and you use this one, I think in a lot of your teaching, but, but in the self-study program, of the flashlight in the warehouse, right? Wherever you aim the flashlight is what you're going to see. Yes. But it was already there. That's it's not the your point. fault you illuminated it with the flashlight, right? That's, the, that's where we've got a bit of control. We don't have control over what's going to be there in the flashlight beam. That's and so the, right the idea that you control it enough for it to be your fault when it, you don't like it is it, it makes no sense if you see how it actually works yes. and if we don't control it 
if it isn't our fault when it's bad and it's not our fault when it's good, then we actually oddly can experience all of it and love all of it because we're experiencing all of it with love. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And you know what's really interesting? There is a fine line between controlling, you know, like we want to control our outcomes and being controlled because very often we think we are doing this because we want to control a situation. In actuality, the situation is controlling us and we're not always aware that that's happening. And I'll, and, and to explain what I mean by this is that we kind of think if I behave this way, I can control my behavior. And if I behave this way, this is the response I get. Now, when you allow a person's negative response to change your behavior because you want a positive response, basically you're being controlled by their responses. In the same way, even when you get positive feedback from people, what happens is we can become addicted to the positive feedback that we stop being authentic. We've allowed that positive feedback to control us as well. So when, while we think we're controlling our behavior, we are actually being controlled. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Hang on one sec. It's upstairs, baby. I don't know where. Sorry, my, you know, high tech uh, broadcast that this is. Um, uh, I, my wife needs a car key. I, I have no idea where it is now. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. That's all right. That's we, all right. Life happens. We have puppy training, and honestly, if the puppy doesn't make it to puppy training, it's gonna get ugly. <laughs> That's important. Puppy training is important. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, which, which is a way to experience God and the devil all in one little creature. It's, you know. <laughs> Puppies and toddlers. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. They're one in the same, one in the same energy. <laughs> uh, and... well, that one in the same energy thing, I don't think that we can overstate that. Yeah. Right? You know, there was, I was reading something the other day uh, in, in just a bit of spiritual text that was saying that we don't need to find the truth. We, we just need to put less weight on our preferences. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that when we kind of see, yeah, I think I'm going to prefer that to this, but I don't know. Sometimes I really like things you wouldn't think I'd like, and sometimes I really don't like things you'd think I'd like. Well, then we're just present to life. Yes. And present to life, everything that comes through us has the flavor of aliveness. And that flavor of aliveness is, it's delicious. It's chocolate ice cream. <laughs> See, that's really delicious. And you, you're so right in that. And oh, we're getting so many beautiful comments as well. And I'm thinking, should we go to some questions? You yeah, let's. To, let's Let's do. do that. We're getting beautiful comments and Marsha Vidal. Thank you. Oh, that's very sweet. She says that she says I'm so wise and full of love. Just don't ask my husband, Danny, if he thinks I'm wise next week when he's on the show. <laughs> more, more questions not to ask during the Ask Danny Anything segment. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I should put up a list of what not to ask. <laughs> That's going to be fun. I'm actually curious as to what people are going to ask Danny. I'm really curious. It's like a list of side effects to medication that they put in the commercials, <laughs> you know, where it's like, ask Danny anything except, and then just a crawl of all these things you're not allowed to ask. Yeah. Him. And they'll move by really fast in tiny That's print. <laughs> uh, Karin Roquet. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly, Karin. After an NDE, how do you deal with material life? I don't feel like working to earn money. There's so much better to share. You are so right. Oh my God, we struggled for so long. Um, so I'll give my take and Michael, you can add your yeah, wisdom. I'll adapt the question because I can't do the after an NDE part. Yeah, I, I, can, I can address it from a different angle, but go for it. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear your angle. So. Um, it wasn't easy. And so let me tell you, there's, there's two aspects to it. The, the enlightenment part or the, let me not use that word. 
the coming back with that feeling of oneness, that is the most beautiful feeling. And the clarity and the understanding made me realize that life is a lot simpler than we think it is. And anybody can get it. Like when, you know, it's, it's not hard to get it, get the truth that, that we are all connected. And if we do things differently, if, if we can get into that feeling, the hard part is in, uh, in living surrounded by people who don't live that way. So in other words, I actually believe that um, we are six sensory beings and those who have an NDE uh, have, have that sixth sense fully blown open, but we all have access to it, but we have been conditioned to believe that we are five sensory beings and therefore we live in a world that has been created by people who are, or has been designed by people who believe they are five sensory beings. And this is why there's no language to describe anything beyond five senses. Uh, we're limited in, in language, expression, and we're made to feel crazy when we describe anything beyond the five senses. That's what makes it challenging. So with Danny and I, and, and here's the other interesting thing. When one of you has an NDE, um, the other will experience a huge shift as well. If you're very close, if you, if you, I know people who's, who have lost, um, a partner or a parent in to death. And when their parent dies, when their parent crosses over, it's as if their loved one is experiencing an NDE, like a huge shift. It's as if that they have transformed something to their loved one. In the case of Danny and me, it was like we both experienced the NDE. Both our lives uh, changed dramatically and both of us couldn't go back to work in our old jobs. We literally had to leave the community we were in. We had to move and I had to, we had to rediscover who we are outside of the community that knew us as the people we used to be. I knew I couldn't go back to being the person I used to be because that was the person that got cancer. Um, but I had to stay true to myself. And when you do stay true to yourself, um, I'm trying to find a short way of saying this, but it was like a portal opens. In my case, what happened was I shared my story on the internet and Wayne Dyer discovered my story and he discovered it at exactly it was a series of synchronicitous moments. And when you are not immersed in, in living a life that you hate, just doing a job to pay the bills, when you are not necessarily preoccupied in a life of fear, fear that you're not going to have money. What happens is when you allow yourself to open up and open up to what the universe um, has for you or to what your higher self or your God self has for you, um, you suddenly notice portals opening up. And I guess that's the best way I can say it. But for me, um, Wayne Dyer discovered my story and I realized that everything I was feeling, that there was a purpose for me to be here. Uh, one of the things that helped me was remembering or knowing after my NDE that I had a bigger purpose and that I had to keep that on the forefront of my mind, that I have a bigger purpose and and that purpose could be lost if I go back to being the way I used to be. So thank you for that question. And Michael, I would love to hear your take on that. It, you know, and, and I think if, because I'm going to assume the majority of people watching this have not had an NDE, um, I certainly haven't, that dying is one way that people wake up to their deeper nature. Meditation might be another way. Um, reading something in a, in a spiritual book, listening to a spiritual teacher might be another. Prayer might be another. Right? Driving behind a beer truck could be another. Literally, we can wake up to our true nature anywhere at any time. It just tends to happen, or we hear about it most when it happens in the midst of extreme circumstances, when it happens in a concentration camp like with Viktor Frankl, when it happens on the operating table, like with Anita. We, we don't tend to hear the ones about people who 
read something and went, oh, and just literally this larger dimension of life opened up for them. So what I've found in terms of being in the world is that I, I have no idea what will make sense and what won't make sense from this place except for when I'm in this place. So when I am in that space in me, the namaste place, the, the place where when you're in that place in you and I'm in that place in me, there's only one of us. There are certain things in my life that are just obvious to do. They're no brainers, right? I don't go to my brain and figure it out. They're obvious. And there are things that maybe I've done for a very long time that it's like, well, why would I continue to do that? But I don't have to logic it through. I can't guess ahead of time. Ah, oh, well, if I were connected to everything, I would still want to do this, but I wouldn't want to do that. It's just that when you are experiencing God, when you are experiencing that deepest self, when you're experiencing that oneness, life is just kind of obvious. There aren't really big decisions to be made. It makes no sense to do some things and total sense to do others. And it just turns out that that guidance system is incredibly reliable, even though it's incredibly unpredictable where it will take you. Like, I, I'm guessing yes. you didn't write your story on the internet going, you know what? I bet in 18 months Wayne Dyer will discover me. <laughs> exactly. No, I wrote it because I wanted the world to know. I, I just felt, oh my God, it can't be this simple, this easy. And, and that was the reason I wrote it because I thought, and it's exactly what you said. I felt you don't have to have an NDE to know this. Why didn't I know this before? If I knew this before, I wouldn't have got the cancer. I wouldn't have died. That's what I felt. So that is speaking to your, you can have it anywhere. You can get this experience from reading a book. I wanted people to get this experience from just hearing my story because I knew they could get it. I knew they could feel it because it's there. It's accessible to all of us. That's well, that was exactly the point of doing a program. I mean, that's the whole point of doing a program called Experiencing God and, and is, is because you can have that experience you, independent of life circumstances. Yes, and you can have that experience. And so the, you know, so the, the question that I think her name is Corinne who asked was how, how does she then, after having such an experience, so let's say it's not even an NDE, but she has experienced it, which is what we are encouraging everyone to do, by just listening to us or going and reading a book or having it while driving in their car or in their shower. Um, how do they then go back to their mundane lives or, um, you know, and how do they, how do they earn money? And this is kind of what I got the impression that Karin was driving at. And here's another post by her where she, she actually had an NDE, uh, where she says, I had a great NDE four years ago. My children also experienced my NDE too, so hard for so it's hard for them, and and I completely believe that because you're very close to your children. It's um, you're you're all connected. It's exactly what happened with my husband and I. And we for for people, for some couples, for many couples, I've heard that they split up after an NDE because the NDE has changed the person who's had it. It's changed it too much and. The other one didn't feel it or didn't resonate with it. In our case, it brought us even closer together. Um, so because it was like we both experienced it. it, it made us realize almost like we are one person, like we're one soul. And we, it's, it's, it's really weird how we both, we almost feel like we're one person. Um, but having said that, I want uh, the harder part has... I'll tell you one thing, it does make you lonelier. It really does. And it makes you value your friendships and your relationships much, much more because you won't find a lot of people that think exactly the same way you do. And it's very hard because tearing yourself away from, and I call it fear-based living. So, so here's the difference. The choice is going back to the fear-based living in order to fit in with everyone else. Um, or in staying in this space, the space of oneness, 
um, and staying in this space that you discovered in your NDE or the space you discovered after hearing someone's story or reading or reading uh, about reading a passage in, in a Buddhism quote, whatever it was that awoke you to that space, it's, it's when you stay in that space, you do risk a lot of people no longer knowing you or understanding you or resonating with you. So it can be a space of loneliness, but I would choose that space over going back to the way I was before. Well, I think there's also for me an element of just being aware of who to talk with about what. Yeah. I can watch a football game with anybody, right? Yeah. But I might not talk about experiencing God at the same bar. I might, but but you just sort of get a sense for how how deep you can go with anybody that you're with, and you know, for me, I look. My family think I'm a little nutty. That's so, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think they probably thought I was a little nutty before. <laughs> Yeah, I know lots of people that think I'm a little nutty like, as well. You know, you know, but uh, you know, it doesn't interfere with us having a great time. Uh, you, you know, going out for a meal or, or spending time. So I think, I, I I think the loneliness, as I've experienced it, what you're describing as the loneliness, is there's something about seeing what's really going on and not being able to express it that creates a sense of separateness. Yeah. But beyond that, the reason why anybody who would choose that over the alternative, over going back, is because underneath that sense of separateness is that sense of absolute interconnectedness. Yeah. It's that sense of absolutely being part of the same ocean. So it's this odd, um, very full emptiness. Yeah. It's interconnected loneliness yeah and i think sometimes the word can put people off because they think of lonely as completely isolated as opposed to no it's just a little weird <laughs> you know it's a little disconcerting it's a little like you know everything is no longer as it seemed i love how you've put it that's very beautifully said and angie mcfarlane she she feels exactly the same way. Great way of putting it, Michael. Thank you, Angie McFarlane. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is true. And, um, and it's true in that there's a lot of people I can hang out with and have dinner with and have fun with. But, um, you know, I am discerning. I mean, of course, now I speak about this publicly, uh, you know, everything that we're talking about, about experiencing God, about um, opening up to the fact that we are, we are facets of God, we're expressions of God. And... Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you, when you do your cruises, like you've got an Alaskan cruise coming up or something. Yes, I do. Like, do you find that that coming together is almost by design a coming together of, of like-minded folk. Is that, oh, well, that there, as if on that's, yes. <laughs> See, that's but, Danny's you, handiwork. You <laughs> those that there's sort of, because I think for any, you know, they talk about shipboard romance, where there's something about going away out of your environment and being in this kind of um, separate environment that tends to make people get, allow people to get closer faster. Yes, the, that is exactly the intention of my cruises, of my retreats. So what's been happening is that over these last few years, I have been um, speaking and sharing my story. And something that comes up over and over again from people is that, that my sharing my story, it's almost like it's given them permission to realize or a permission to awaken within themselves. But then the struggle is just like Corinne's question, you know, going back and living in this world. So I kept getting this calling, this pull, um, or these voices, I get voices in my head, where literally I was being guided to develop longer retreats. It's no longer just about going and doing a keynote or a one hour or an hour and a half. Um, it, it was, I was actually getting downloads 
of how to create these retreats so that people can remain in this space that we're talking about for longer periods of time. So if you imagine we're together in that space of oneness, in that space of experiencing God with like-minded people who feel the same way, but away from your own environment and you're experiencing this together and you're holding that for each other together for a full seven days, um, eventually what it gives rise to is something much bigger, something much deeper, and it entrenches the experience so that there's no way you can go back to being the person you were. But you also now have a community of people because bonding happens in a way like never before. Because I did a cruise earlier this year and um, it was just, it, it blew me away. So I get as much out of it as the people who attend. It really blew me away what we can achieve. And even the cruise director said, oh my God, that was really amazing. And she said, we've got to do more. We've got to do this every year. So that's why next year we decided to choose Magical Alaska. And, and because I've done one, I'm now, it's almost like there's something guiding me and giving me more content and more ways to, to help us to experience it, but also hold on to it so that we have it with us even beyond the cruise. We build a community. Um, we've lived with it for seven days. We know what it feels like. We know how to hold it. Uh, so that's, I guess, there's a lot more information on the page, on the cruise page, which is, um, I think it's anitamurjani.com slash cruise. But yeah, thanks for asking about it, Michael. It's, it's now, and I'm, I'm kind of jealous and thinking maybe Nina and I need to come. But <laughs> That's one side. We can talk later. I think what you said about it's about marinating in the experience long enough that it infuses you. Yes. It, 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 See, good it, words it's, again. Thank you. Touching it. It's not just getting it. Oh yes, that, that sounds very good. I I would like to experience God. Thank you. It it's it's it because it, it getting into the bones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Usually when you say something gets into the bones, it's like a chill. It's something that's bad that you don't want to get into the bones. But we're trying to get God in the bones. Yes. Right? We're trying to get this oneness into our very being so that, um, you know, it's, it's I, again, in the self-study program, I talk about Jung and Carl Jung and how he would talk about invoked or not invoked. God is present, invoked or not invoked this possibility this one energy, this godding is happening, and we're just more or less present to it in any given moment. And that's why things like going and spending a week with you, going and, and, and uh, you know, taking the time to go through a self-study program, the people who came along on, the, on live weekends with us, it, it's just an opportunity for it to be real and experiential instead of theoretical and, you, you know, because theoretical... Yeah. Conversations always make you feel either better than everyone else or worse than everyone else, exactly. right? It's either, oh, I get it and they don't, or, oh, God, everyone gets it and I don't. Whereas at the level of experience, there's no hierarchy. Yeah. We're all having our experience of God, our individual experience of the universal, our separate experience of that which can never be separate. Yeah. And that, for me, is the highest goal, like that. That's the reason to be in this conversation at all. I, again, very well put. And, and you, you said a beautiful quote there that in, in the individual experience, there is no hierarchy because an experience is an experience. It's not about understanding or not understanding. It's about experiencing it. And yes, and you're absolutely right. And, um, and one of the things that I try and achieve at events that I mean at these long these retreats I do for example the cruise I choose something where everything is taken care of for you like I choose a venue like the cruise where you don't have to think about your meals you don't have to think about anything because one of the things about a lot of people who um, who have either had such an experience or such an awakening in whatever way when they try to hold on to it and they're trying to live in this spiritual in this physical world they believe that 
in order to be spiritual, I have to be of service to everyone. And then it no longer becomes about being God. It becomes as something they do. They start to think, I need to be of service. I should be doing more. And a trap that a lot of people, particularly sensitive people, empaths, who are more prone to these enlightening experiences, are also more prone to giving and giving of themselves in the belief that they are being spiritual, but they don't know how to receive. And they get completely drained. And when they become drained, they then manifest all kinds of stuff in their, in their bodies um, because it's their bodies telling them, hey, you got to take care of yourself, you're getting drained. So this is, this is a typical thing that happens. Um, so anyway, one of the things about the, taking people away from their home environment on something like a cruise is to give them the experience of, ex of receiving and getting them into the habit of receiving and so that they realize that it's not selfish. This is recharging my battery. I don't have to think about receiving because they're treated with utmost, um, they're surrounded in utmost luxury on something like that. So they start to feel that, okay, the, when I experience this, when I experience God, because, you know, we're doing our meditation and we're getting into these higher and higher states of being, but all our needs are being taken care of. We don't have to worry about everyone else and kind of be out there in the trenches saying, I got to be of service, I got to be of service. So what happens, what I'm trying to attain or what the idea here is that when you are godding, giving and receiving both become a non-issue. It's like just, you just go in the flow and it just, it's like a cycle. It just happens because you are allowing God to express itself through you and when we don't allow ourselves to receive we're actually blocking half that channel and but when we get to a state where both giving and receiving are a non-issue we don't even have to think in terms of oh how do I charge my batteries oh I, I don't know how to receive we don't even have to think in terms of how do I be of service to people that's kind of what I, I the I idea behind the whole thing. There's two things for me that I think are so key in that. One is that that recognition that it, it, it's there's nothing to do. Yeah. Right. This is not a doing. This is not something you get. This is not something you achieve. This is not an accomplishment. It's actually what's sitting there underneath the desire to achieve and accomplish. Um, the, the other thing, and it's, um, I just can't think of any other way to bring it in, but we're, 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 we're going to give you a chance to give and receive a discount on, <laughs> on, on the self-study program. <laughs> so if you, if you haven't, we know a lot of you have done the Experience in God self-study program. But if it's something that you'd like to do, you can find out um, uh, more at michaelnail.org forward slash experiencing God. And if you use the code FB Live, as in Facebook Live, um, you'll get $100 off the program. So that's just for people who have taken the time to be with us and to, and to watch this and hopefully to enjoy it as well. And, for, um, and I'm also aware that not everybody can take the time out or spend the money to come on the cruise. So this Experiencing God program can be a form of a retreat because um, how, um, remind me how many sessions there are. Do you remember? So many. 20? 20 sessions. I 20 think. sessions. So literally, you could do one session a day over 20 days or one every few days. And so it no, could and also, be... Go back and, and kind of dive, you know, do everything in a day, but then go back and, 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 and do it over time. So it's, uh, you know, one of the things that both Anita and I have is we really only ever say one thing, right? Which if you were going to kind of sum it up, it probably is something along the lines of you are God. Yeah. Right. But we do it in so many different ways, just in hopes that there will be a way that's perfect for you to hear it. Yes. There will be a form, whether it's a cruise, whether it's an online program, whether it's just this Facebook Live, whether it's reading one of our books, where yeah. you just hear it in a way that it wakes you up to what's yeah. already there. And that's really just that's that's why we do what we do as best I understand it is in hopes that sooner or later that happy accident 
you know, we people become more accident prone <laughs> yep. to experience this. Yep. You've summed it up really well. That's exactly why I do what I do. It's, um, you know, it, it is just so people will have that happy accident. <clears throat> and, you know, I just want to be an instrument for people to have that happy accident of when they stumble on that same place, that same feeling, that same opening, that same portal that I stumbled into. Yeah. So this was a great conversation. I think we had some really good comments and um, we will be putting the links in into the comments for your book, Michael, your new book. Congratulations on that. I highly recommend that. We'll put the link to the book. We'll put a link to the Alaskan cruise and we'll put a link to the um, also for the Experiencing God program. And so for anybody who's interested, but I hope like whether you guys purchase or buy or come on the cruise, that's irrelevant. I hope that this conversation alone was enough to wake up some of you. And also both Michael and I, I think we have tons of videos on YouTube, don't we? Do you... yeah, it's kind of obscene, really. It's just, just calm. I, I, I keep thinking uh, maybe at some point we need to stop talking, but so far so good. So <laughs> I know so far so good. And um, yeah, so if you guys want to check us out, I, we both have our YouTube respective YouTube channels um, and all my past videos are on YouTube. Once we're done with Facebook, uh, with doing the Facebook video, we usually upload it onto YouTube within a couple of days. So you'll be able to find it on YouTube. And uh, and if you like us, please subscribe to our channels. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I know that we'll probably go back and look at your comments. So we'd love to still continue to hear your feedback. Any last words, Michael? Oh, well, I, I, I hope not, though. I'm less scared if they were my last words because I might be a near-death experience and I'd be fine. But um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I think if there was one thing that I'd love people to take away from this is, is it's just the simplicity that you don't have to beat up your ego to move beyond it. Yes, that is so true. The ego's got a bad rap and not for, and, and uh, yeah, you don't have to beat it up. Oh, final comment from someone named Cecil Cecil. She says, don't stop. <laughs> she wants us to keep, <laughs> he, he or she, sorry, um, wants us to keep going. It is a she from the photo. Um, Thank you. I'd, I'd love to keep going, but we probably both have to go um, and let everybody continue with their Sundays. Michael, thank you so much. As always, it's it's always wonderful and enlightening talking to you. So, a pleasure. This, I feel very much the same. Thank you. And happy Sunday, everybody, if, if it's Sunday for you, where and when you're watching. And enjoy the rest of your week and find us wherever, on social media, anywhere. Happy Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving as well for those of you who celebrate. That's right. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye.